The power of Kodiak Island's wind and water, it's in the international spotlight. Also in Kodiak, the community went digging to find out what life was like thousands of years ago. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builders Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. One of the most challenging frontiers for our state is the high cost of energy in Alaska, 50% higher than the national average, largely because of rural Alaska's dependence on diesel fuel. But one community has bucked this trend, and Emily Carlson joins us now to tell us about how Kodiak is actually one of two cities in the nation that's close to having 100% renewable energy. Yeah, amazing. it is, Rhonda. It is amazing. So as you said, sky electricity rates have skyrocketed for everyone since 2001, except in Kodiak, where they are paying 2.5% less than they did 14 years ago. So how did they do it? They are using groundbreaking technology that has the whole world paying attention. On a clear day, Kodiak Island is stunning. Sun like this is rare. It showcases this jaw-dropping view, which does double duty. Kodiak is a, a rainy place at times, and it's a windy place too. So we take advantage of those two natural elements to, to make a lot of our power. This is where the town gets 70% of its electricity. Yeah, that's, that's always here. Kodiak Electric sure Association CEO Darren to Scott to takes us for a walk on Terror Lake Dam. Right now, it's the highest he's ever seen. The lake being this full charges your battery, so to speak. Yes, yeah, it, we use this as a big battery and it kind of charges our battery too. Um, it just keeps us motivated throughout the year because this is, this is our cornerstone for power. The key is the lake's high elevation. From here, the water drops 1,400 feet into the hydro plant. So this is the workhorse right this here. This is it. This is the guy that, without this, the hydro wouldn't be any good. These giant copper generators convert water pressure into electricity. The hydro plant costs about $30,000 a day to operate. KEA's diesel plant, more than three times that, $100,000 a day. So it's really quiet in here. None of, none of the stuff is working or running right now, but that's a good thing. Well, yeah, it's a good thing. When, when, uh, when, these, when these guys are silent, we know that the rain and the wind are giving us power. KEA Board President Cliff Davidson shows us around the plant. Just an emergency backup now. The result of a crazy idea. Ditch diesel for wind. You take the chance because you live on an island and uh, Island life is sometimes, uh, you, you're forced to take a risk. We definitely felt we were taking a risk. There were a lot of butterflies in the process. Kodiak was the first in Alaska to install giant wind turbines, but it wasn't easy. First, they had to convince General Electric to sell them three. Then the challenge of installing them. There were some nail biters along the way, but uh, they've worked so well for the town, uh, saved us so much money. The windmills make enough energy to replace 2.8 million gallons of diesel KEA was burning each year. That's a savings of $7 million for a total of 27 million since 2011. Its success paid for three more. This one here is just getting ready to start. But you can't rely on the wind. Who knows when she'll blow? We were in Kodiak five days and saw the windmills move just twice. So on still days, the hydro plant kicks in more energy. Combine the two strengths and uh, wind turbines run, hydro backs off. Wind turbines are not running like today. Hydro picks back up the load and they just work in concert together really, really well. Uh, Devil's Club. A sweet tune for brewer Bill Milstein. He takes pride in every pint of his Kodiak Brewing Company's craft beer. The grains have to be very uniform size and they have to have certain protein content. But if the process is off by even one degree, 
The grain can sprout and ruin the entire batch. It's like a science experience. Oh, it is a science, yeah. yeah. It's complicated, and it takes a lot of energy. Ben's average electric bill tops $1,400 a month. It may sound like a lot, but Ben says thanks to wind and water power, it hasn't gone up in years. All right. Like his cutting edge beer recipes, Ben is proud KEA is pushing the limits and he's toasting the rewards. Somebody's got to be the first one to do it. You know, somebody does. And, and you can't just say, oh, no one's done it before, therefore it shouldn't be done or it can't be done. A few miles south, Kodiak's Coast Guard search and rescue teams protect four million miles of ocean. We're basically a, a small city with all the demands of a small city. The Coast Guard uses 30% of the electricity KEA produces. But they're also doing their part to conserve. When the fan doesn't turn on, it'll trigger an alarm. So High tech to the rescue. This is the air handling unit. This sophisticated control system keeps track of all 25 buildings on base. It's smart too, and can pinpoint inefficiencies. We found a lot of broken stuff. <laughs> it was, it was a, uh, um, kind of a painful process. Over the past 10 years, energy consumption dropped 45% on base. In Kodiak, renewable energy doesn't just save money, it preserves their island and their way of life. There's just a, a motivation to, to do it right, and that's the right thing to do. Down on the docks, you'll find the king of Kodiak's economy. You know, seafood is number one in Kodiak. But the season isn't always reliable. Right now, it's quiet at North Pacific Seafood. Just a few fishermen stocking up on ice before heading out to sea. The salmon run hasn't hit yet, but when it does, it will push KEA's wind and water resources to the max. Kodiak is really unique. We've got unique challenges, but obviously KEA has come up with some very unique solutions. One of those solutions. There's 1,200 batteries in here. Giant batteries that take the energy the turbines make on a windy day and save it. When the blades stop, they provide a 30 to 90 second surge of power until the hydro plant kicks in. But it's tough on those batteries. This makes the power, this conditions it, to get the right kind of power that we need, and that tells it what to do. Which brings us here. This is helping Kodiak's green power become the most efficient on the planet. It keeps a close eye on energy levels. Too low, and the lights in town turn off. But the flywheels stop that from happening with a few seconds of power. These systems are used in, a, in maybe about a dozen places in the world. The batteries are used in, in a few places in the world as well but we're the first ones to use them both at the same time. On Pillar Mountain, the wind turbines have become an important part of the community. They're proud their tiny island town is leading the world's green energy movement. It's a win-win all the way around. So you may be thinking, why doesn't every city, town, and village in Alaska do the same thing? The answer is that Kodiak is unique. Their hydro plant is so successful because they get so much rain. The Alaska Climate Research Center says about 78 inches a year. Here in Anchorage, Rhonda, we get just 17. I'm glad we just get <laughs> 17. But anyway, boy, a fascinating piece. Emily Landine, beautiful photojournalism there. But I think everybody is wondering, you know, what does this technology cost? Well, it's expensive. $60 million a year, or not a year, in total for that project. But they got some help, 17 million from the from uh, the renewable energy fund the, from the state, and seven million from the legislature. But get this, it'll pay for itself in just nine years. So that's a good deal there. Well, one of the things that you say is 100% renewable. I mean, and Kodiak is not quite there. What does that mean? They're not quite there. They're 99.7, almost there. But they have to turn those diesel that diesel plant on four times a year just to make sure that it works as a backup. So they're not 100%, they don't get that title. There's only one city in the country, Burlington, Vermont, that's 100%. But they say, hey, we're 0.3% away. That's good enough for that's us. That's an inspiration. All right, well, thanks very much.
Well, we have time now for a trivia question that Emily provided us, in fact, about emission savings in Kodiak. Thanks to renewable energy, the emission savings in Kodiak would be enough to take about how many cars off the road? In other words, since Kodiak isn't burning diesel, what's the equivalent in auto emissions that we don't have? Nearly 2,000? Or is it 5,000? Close to 15,000? Almost 50,000? Well, We'll have the answer for you a little later on on Frontiers. Well, ahead, we continue our conversation. The king of renewables, Bernie Carl, is here. And to use his phrase, do a little imagineering. Digging deeper into a ludic history, I'm Heather Hinsey in Kodiak, where members of the community are pitching in to preserve pieces of the past. Well, they call Bernie Carl the Imagineer of Chena Hot Springs, and he joins us today to stretch our imaginations, do a little what he calls visioneering. Many people, Bernie, and thanks for coming all the way from Fairbanks to be with us, uh, know your resorts for the hot water. It's sort of a recreational thing, but for you, it's much more than that. It's a laboratory. It's nature's best laboratory. Nature will teach you everything if you're looking. All you have to do is look, and it'll show you how to do it all. So what have you learned? Well, I've learned that uh, to be sustainable, uh, you have to work at it, first of all. Nature has zero waste, and if you just look at that, nature will show you how you should do it all. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We're following nature's book. It's right in front of all of us, and we're taking a hug from the earth. Everybody likes a hug. We decided we should make our energy, we should do our refrigeration, and we should grow our food from taking a hug from the earth. Well, one of the things that is a little bit unique is in a lot of traditional geothermal generating plants that they use much hotter water than you have at Chena. So how did you get around that to make electricity and do all the things you do? Chena has the first geothermal power plant in the world to make electricity off of 160 degree water. And the very, that's the first in the world, but it's the first geothermal power plant in Alaska. We worked with United Technologies to develop that. Uh, now, uh, that, that's, it's an uh, organic Rankine cycle, it's a turbine, and now we have a screw expander, the first one in the world that is synchronous. We have absorption chilling, the first three pressure absorption chiller in the world to keep the ice hotel frozen. And there's a lot of firsts because uh, if you're pushing, if you, if you have an imagination, then you get to push the limits. So I guess a lot of people probably don't understand the technology that you just described, but basically you're using a, a reverse refrigeration system to make geothermal energy. Absolutely, to, to use geothermal energy. There's geothermal energy everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about your greenhouses and some of the things that you do. You heat those greenhouses with your geothermal. We heat 54 buildings on the property, all with geothermal. And the greenhouse is very important because we have, this is energy. We're taking the energy from the earth and putting it into this plant that gives you the energy for doing this interview today. And this here is, uh, I mean, this is basil. I mean, now this is, it's alive. Just smell that. Oh, I've smelled it across the table. Oh my it's goodness. great stuff. But this is stuff that is grown in your greenhouse. And we're it's, seeing. it's alive. It's fresh every day. And that makes a huge difference. We're talking 365 days a year. We're talking about growing stuff daily, so minus what's the 50, application minus 60 below. For the bush, I mean, they, not every village has a hot springs. Well, I'll tell you what the bush has. Every bush has a power plant, and I'll guarantee you they're not using 100% of their waste heat. I'll guarantee it. I've been to a lot of the bush villages. Some of them have combined heat and power, but they don't use it all. And we built a grow chamber that it's just in a 40-foot connex, insulated, and it turns out 150 heads of lettuce every week, 150 heads in an area that is eight foot wide by 40 foot long. So every village can do that. We grow all of the food for the animals, for the chickens, for the reindeer, for the pigs, and the horses, and we grow it in a grow chamber. So you can do that every day. You plant one pound of barley, you get eight pounds of hay. It's amazing to go out there, and one of the things, things that you do every year is you, know, you have a renewable energy fair. Uh, to showcase some of what you're doing, what other people are doing. How long has that been going on? Ten years. This is our tenth year coming up on it. And I can tell you, Senator Stevens, when he was alive, was at every one. And he had, had he not died in an accident, he would have made the sixth one. So uh, uh, it's amazing because everything is, we, we come up with something new every year. 
Plus we show all the old, we share all this knowledge. Knowledge isn't any good if it isn't shared. So you can come there and you get to actually touch it and feel it, see it working. It's totally different than reading about it. When you touch and feel and you taste, it's a total different experience. And I believe that's what we do. We give that experience. We don't charge for that experience. And you get ice cream and hot dogs and chili and <laughs> you get fed. It's great. Uh, it's a very kid-friendly event, too. And a lot of things for the kids. And uh, one of the things, too, is that we'll see things like this, some of your project work. You want to talk a little bit about what you're doing with recyclables? The recyclables are pretty amazing because this is all stuff that's being buried. Nature has zero waste, zero waste. God only made one mammal that deliberately destroys his environment and then denies it. I'm talking to us, man. This is cardboard and paper. It's turned into a fuel log. You burn this in your wood stove, any wood stove or in a gasifier. It has 8,000 BTUs per pound. You can see it's just cardboard and paper. You can even read some of the newsprint. This is a small fuel pellet that we bank. This is also 8,000 BTUs per pound. Take the place of coal. This is paper creed. It's a 20-year-old patent. This is cardboard and paper. It's an R3 per inch. Your home, probably one of the best homes in Alaska, be an R30. This will be R90. You'll be able to build R90 homes out of this. Have you got any demonstration projects with that? There will be soon, because we're going to build an R90 home at Chena Hot Springs, R90. Just to see how it works. Just so people can come touch it and feel it. Everyone wants to touch and feel. We're in a touch and can feel I world. Can I touch? Touch that. <laughs> now you see, well, that's, heavy. that's cardboard and paper with a little Portland cement, totally fireproof. This has the ground glass in it because we, we take all the glass in, we grind it up, and we use this in some of the, in some of the paper creep. We gather all the metals. This is, this, is, this is the wiring out of a home that's ground up. We grind it up. We make a nice product for sale. Uh, so the thing of it is is that the opportunities now are, are endless, but it's making things better making things better. I mean, there's more opportunity now than there's ever been in the history of man. Well, I have to ask you this because you've had this fair for quite a while. Is there, is there any one breakthrough that you've had or anything that you've shown people that has made a difference? I would think the biggest thing we show people is that it doesn't take money and it doesn't take brains. It takes vision and it takes passion. And I believe they leave there with more vision and more passion for being sustainable. I believe sustainable is attainable. And I believe Alaska was the leader in sustainability 10,000 years ago. You know, the natives had fish camp. They had hunting camp. They, they went to where they were sustainable. They didn't take more than they needed, ever. Now, do you think that we are still a frontier? You know, we always refer to ourselves as the frontier state, but in terms of renewable energy? Well, we're a frontier state, but I would say we're leading the parade in, in renewables. And I say that because we have, as a for instance, the first geothermal power plant uh, to run on 106 degree water, the first absorption chiller, the first screw expander that is synchronous. They're all in Alaska. And then we just saw what's going on in Kodiak. Kodiak is now at 99%. That's really as good as it gets. I'm telling you, Kodiak had, they had vision. They had passion. You know, that's what it took to get that done. Those are the two ingredients that Kodiak has. We're just about out of time, but at this year's fair, one thing you're going to feature, the Sterling engine. The Sterling engine. Sterling was a, the Sterling engine is an external combustion engine. It's going to change Bush, Alaska. It's 10 kW. It weighs 80 pounds. It'll run on any fuel. You name the fuel and it'll run on it. It'll run on this. It'll run on this. Anything that burns, it'll run on. Oh, well, that will be exciting to find out about. Well, thank you very much, Bernie, for being with us. And we are going to continue the conversation on our website and talk more about your gardens. We also have a gallery of the greenhouse on the frontier section of KTVA.com. Well, still ahead, we'll have an answer to that trivia question we posed earlier and working together in Kodiak to preserve Alutic history. Well, we're going to take you back to our trivia question. So here we go. With renewable energy, the emission savings in Kodiak would be enough to take about how many cars off the road? Nearly 2,000, nearly 5,000, 
nearly 15,000, or D, about 50,000? Well, according to the Clean Energy States Alliance, the answer is nearly 15,000 cars, 14,848 to be exact. In other words, that's what a, what's equivalent to what Kodiak Electric would be using if they burned diesel fuel. Now, this is over a period of five years, but still substantial. I want to change gears here. While Kodiak is rich in renewable energy, it's also rich in history. The Alutic Museum has a 20-year tradition of inviting the community to dig deeper into the past. Heather Hinsey takes us on an archaeological adventure. This is the third year students and volunteers have been digging at the Kashaverov site outside Kodiak. It's an effort to understand what life was like around Women's Bay thousands of years ago. It's an excavation thousands of years in the making. And it's a site that people lived at from about 7,000 years ago and right up to 19 to 12 we found cow bones. Volunteers and students from around the country are in Kodiak for the Alutic Museum's annual community dig. They methodically scrape through layers of soil and volcanic ash looking for ancient artifacts. The further back in time, the harder it is to recognize stuff like that. So that's why we have to dig carefully in layers. This area was likely a sea mammal hunting camp, tucked back into the hills near a lake that vanished over time. Wait, what? Oh. <gasps> wow. <laughs> so she found part of a ground slate spear point. And so it would have been longer than this, but you can see it's ground oh, on no, both right. edges to be sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be used for hunting sea mammals like seals or possibly whales. By unearthing important items, the team can piece together the past. The most exciting thing, most complete thing was three years ago we found a house, 300 year old house out there. That was cool to see. Museum intern Jesse Nakasoni um, grew up in California. He didn't know much about his Alutic heritage until he started working on these digs. It's a lot of fun for me and I enjoy learning about the past and seeing how people survived. UAA student Alexandria Mullen grew up in Kodiak. She remembers collecting fossils from the beach with her grandparents, but couldn't connect them to her Alaska Native culture. I always thought it was interesting, but never really knew the time period that it came from and um, really the history of the Aleutic people. So I'm definitely learning a lot here. Digging up history is a dirty job. Boston University professor Catherine West sifts through every bucket of soil students collect. She's done excavations around Kodiak for years, but this is her first time at the community site. The people here were incredibly resilient through time. They fished salmon, fished cod, fished halibut for thousands of years, despite changes in the environment, changes in climate. Getting the artifacts out of the ground is just the first step. At the Aludic Museum in Kodiak, volunteers clean and catalog the collection. Each year, the team recovers about 2,000 pieces. Because really, without all this archeological data, a rock is just a rock. Mm -hmm. And it's actually um, the stratigraphy and the features that bring the site to life. Is that wood? For students, it's a chance to see every aspect of archaeology. It kind of puts what you learn in a classroom into practice, which is very different. Sitting around talking about an excavation is different than actually going out and getting money and putting your hands in the dirt. Everything they've collected during the four-week dig will stay in Kodiak at the museum. It will ultimately lead to a better understanding of how Alaska's first people lived so long ago. For Frontiers, I'm Heather Hinsey in Kodiak. And the team is going to wrap up their dig next week. And you can learn more and to find other sto stories about Kodiak, visit the Frontier section of KTVA.com. Well, I don't think we're ever going to run out on frontiers of ideas to explore, do you? <laughs> well, we want to thank you again for being a part of our weekly Alaskan journey. And from all of us at KTVA, may you find your own frontiers. <laughs>